Welcome to my review and thoughts on the 1994 Danish version of Night Watch, or as one character suggests it should be called, Night Guard, because not of all, all of us are equally good at English. And yeah, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I absolutely loved. Uh, the video will have some jokes and we'll get into some serious topics. If you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies, because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I will be comparing it to movies from the same time. And I have not watched the remake, not intending to. I am excited for the sequel, and that is why I'm doing, you know, rewatching and doing a video on this movie now, slash at all. I realize this video is long, I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review where if I spoil anything, I'll verbally warn before I do so, hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler, which you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Probably not gonna be spoiling anything anyway. And uh, as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the review will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So this movie is rated R. And yeah, um, it's not as violent as that suggests, so if that's, you know, if that's a big part of why you go to these movies, yeah, this is not really gonna scratch that itch, but it does use the R rating, and it's not one of those movies that you could easily just have made, like PG-13, it really wouldn't have made sense. And, um, let's see. And some of the themes are also very mature. Now, that brings us. Yeah, uh, I'm. I've watched this at least twice. I'm not sure I've watched it more than twice. Uh, the first time I watched it was in 2009. I've owned the DVD since. I don't remember watching it in the in between. Um,. Yeah, you know, there's just, there's other movies that do the same, but have, you know, are slightly better for various reasons. Now, I, with that said, I do think it is cool that, you know, yeah, the, the whole thing of, you know, oh, everything's remakes and sequels, yeah, that's a thing here in Denmark too, so we're getting a sequel to a movie that's nearly 30 years old, but... And, and not really one that was, like, crying out for a sequel, but, you know, they got some of the cast back. That's very cool. Like, major, you know, some of the, some of the lead characters, uh, they have those actors back. Anyway, the plot. A law student starts working as a night watchman at the Department of Forensic Medicine in Copenhagen. His mad friend, I, I mean, I think... His intense friend, let's go with that, gets him on a game of dare that escalates as a serial killer's victims start piling up at work. Uh, yeah, I think that's what I will stick with. So, yeah, um, let's dive right in. The the Yeah, so this was both written and directed by Ole Bornedale. And... Yeah, um, other than this, I have to admit, I haven't watched, like, there's, he's made a lot, let's see, he's, he's written 21, and then there's the upcoming, yeah, he also wrote the, the sequel, he's directed 19 that are out, and, again, the, the sequel to this, and, ah, yeah, like, other than this, I subjected myself to the entirety of 1864, Edensee Fiatres, which I really tried. Like, I felt like the first episode, you know, I was like, okay, I see what people are criticizing. I'm like, I'm going to give it a chance. Maybe it gets, you know, it's not the worst start I've ever seen, but it just kept going it's like it's at least a third longer than it should be it is i i i seriously respect anyone 
who did not check out at, you know, Prussian Urukai. That was, I think I pretty much had checked out by that point. I, I seriously admire anyone who, who was not, anyone for whom that was not the last straw. But yeah, I, I did watch the entire thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things, like, I don't, yeah. It was definitely too long, and they made some very questionable choices along the way. But yeah, um, other than that, I'm actually not super familiar with his work. I, I do think it's very cool that, like, you know, he is still working. Like, his career, yeah, it, you know, let's see. Okay, so the very first thing he directed is listed as 80, 1989, a TV, yeah, this was the first feature, so he's been directing features for almost 30 years now, still working, that's very cool, you know, directing is very, very intense, and the, the, the yeah, it's, it's very, very impressive when someone can keep working for so long. And, you know, there are a lot of people who think that he's an absolutely amazing writer-director. So, you know, better when one of those keeps working for a really long time than, you know, an Wibble or John Moore. I suppose that is more or less... Yeah, so... The, the the handling of plot twists is sadly kind of just okay. Like, there's one major twist in this that, you know, a lot of people have, have expressed guessing way before the, the actual reveal. You know, I'd say about 31 minutes before it's actually revealed you have all the information, it's right there, you don't really, like, you know, you're not, like, stupid if you didn't piece it together, but if you didn't piece it together, you probably weren't really trying. Like, if, if you go into the movie thinking, I'm gonna figure out who the killer is, you're almost definitely gonna guess it before it actually, before the movie actually reveals it. And I think also just the movie does reveal it a tad too soon. I think the movie would be better. It would work better if the reveal was pushed just like five or ten minutes. That would really have meant a lot. And yeah. Now, let's see. So the. Right. Um, yes. So some critic quotes about the direction. So the the yeah originally uh, Bornadale worked in radio. Uh, you know, in in the eighties he did these you know completely audio based kinds of things, and you can really tell from this that he has a very high respect for the power of audio. The, the, you know, I, I've seen, you know, depending on who you ask, some people phrase it somewhat harshly as audio is the cheapest way to scare an audience. I prefer the phrasing that says it's often the most effective way. Anything you show allows our eyes to adjust to it eventually even freddy krueger as horrifying as he looks eventually we all got used to what he looked like they even kind of started playing around like you know they had they had like jokes you know like if you go back in the first one he's not really making jokes like he'll say things that like oh you know it's like a play on words or something you know but it's not really funny it's just very very intimidating you know and eventually he's just going around making jokes and people are like cheering hoping to see him and here it's not really th this is not the the it's not that the film is visual but the scares are often via the audio rather than the visuals 
and yeah, just like any anything you hear that you don't see clearly, your mind is gonna start making pictures, and those pictures can't be topped by almost anything a movie can put in front of you. You know, there's a lot of movies where the visual works really well, but horror movies, like a lot of the best ones, it's the the implication. It's what your where your mind goes rather than what you see. Now, yeah, so the yeah the American version, it's Ewan McGregor and Nick Nolte, and I gotta say the fact that the two of them are kind of a letdown, or I suppose it's not it's not their fault, and it's not Bonadale's fault either. Uh, you know, it's just it's it's what American the the what American studios think of the American viewer wants. That's why the the you know I haven't watched that one, but I have watched at least a couple of hundred American movies. Uh, you know, I I love a lot of American cinema. I I don't think that the American moviegoer is as ignorant and simple-minded as a lot of American studios seem to think they are, but it does not really help matters that a lot of the worst, you know, like, there's some, there's some incredibly bad American movies that actually did really, really well, you know, like, there's a reason that you know, Friday the 13th became a huge success. They made, you know, 10 movies, one spin-off, or crossover, I suppose, one remake, you know, they probably say, if the remake hadn't been so badly handled, they would probably be making them today. You know, they recently made three Halloween movies, you know, pretty big fan of, you know, I'm not saying they're the best movies ever made, but they're definitely the best of the sequels by a long shot, but the, yeah, the fact that incredible movies get missed by the American public does mean that a lot of American movies get made that are just not really trying that hard, and that is something that, you know, say what you will about this movie, it's not really phoning it in, you know. I, I've seen some people, like, for sure, there's a... Not everyone thinks it's equally good. And it definitely does, like, I... Considering, you know, so yeah, like I mentioned, this is from 1994, and the movie Seven is from 1995, you know, so... People didn't have to wait very long to get something that was like, just, yeah, you know, it's not fair to have to compete with David Fincher, but, you know, you kind of do, you kind of do have to, if you're going to make a movie that's in, and, and I'm not saying that when they were making this movie they could have known about Seven. Like I mentioned, this came out before Seven. But it is just, you know, this didn't have to, this this could have been more of a contender when it, when it comes to that. And it is this thing that, like, I don't think it was trying as much to be you know, this, like, competition for the American, you know, the, the, um, yeah, it just isn't, it's, it's more like trying to see, can we Danes make, you know, a, a movie that has these very American traits to it, you know, is, is that, would that be interesting, basically? You know, more than... That's, you know, if you don't know Denmark, we're nowhere near as, as like, hyper-capitalistic as America is. So, yeah, like, it was it was kind of, you know, there's, there's this 
game of dares in the in the movie that I may have already mentioned. You know, it kind of feels like the movie was almost made on a dare. You know, and they and they went they they tried to make make it the best they could. But it wasn't trying to like you know, upend cinema. It wasn't trying to you know and, and it's all you know, it wasn't the first of the nineties serial killer movies, uh, you know, I, I'm not 100% certain if the first one was The Silence of the Lambs, which, you know, has aged very poorly for its transphobia, but otherwise is quite impressive for, for many reasons. The, the, I'm not certain if it was the very first one, but that one definitely did set a tone you know there was a certain expectation and that's also the thing this movie doesn't really live up to that and I don't really think it is trying to you know now let's see and I would, I would definitely say you know it's it's a movie it's never boring and I don't think that there's really any scene that just feels like you know why what was that there for you know there's always some purpose but you know it's not trying to it's it's you know american movies also have this thing where they're kind of they're scared that the audience will tune out so you know american audience that has been raised on like tv with you know a break every seven minutes that you know we we have ad breaks as well but it's every 15 minutes and I may I mean I can't speak for every Dane out there but I've always felt that it was like okay uh, let's I'm gonna go get myself you know pick something out of the fridge that I can sit and eat when it comes back from you know we have one break every 15 minutes or for movies it's every half hour but you know if it's a half hour show it doesn't make sense to only do one after the inside but yeah and ours are not I want to say the American ones it's been a while since I was in America but yeah like two or three minutes ours are like five minutes you know every 15 minutes for for shows that are less than an hour every half hour for movies or stuff that's longer than an hour yeah, it's kind of just like, okay, uh, you know, I'll, I'll grab myself something to eat, maybe, you know, I mean, I guess today, like, check tweets or something, you know, just, we we kind of zone out, where Americans, you know, because it's so short, it might be too short for you to get up and do anything, so you're just going to sit and watch these inane ads. I'm really, really glad I'm not forced to watch American commercials anymore. Um, yeah, you know, what can I say? Uh, we were engaged, she liked American television, I didn't want to constantly be saying, can we do something other than watch television, so, yeah, that's, that's how it ended up with, anyway, back to credit quotes, it seems that are not of a hospital that tend to fall flat, there are a couple of side stories with, oh, right, he, yeah, Martin, one with his less, with his, Integrity less bud and one that revolves around his girlfriend both don't work very well. Yeah. You may feel otherwise, but the balance between the silliness of a comedy, the seriousness of a thriller didn't mesh so well for this feller. Yeah, that's the yeah. Some people don't maybe it is a Danish thing. I've been I've been trying to to figure out over you know, because every so often I'll I'll find a movie that I think is really good does a really good job mixing comedy with other, at least one other genre, and I'll read reviews, and a lot of people are saying, I wish it had either been a comedy or this other genre, you know. I've, I've, I've felt since childhood that it, you know, it's great if you can mix both. You know, if, if you're screaming from fear one scene and laughing uproariously in another, that can be not always is and I don't you know there's a lot of excellent horror movies that don't have that much comedy but if you can do both you know it's it's it can work incredibly well you know this is something we've seen with 
I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, um, Jordan Peele in, in more recent years. And let's see, a great little film that could easily have been made by Hitchcock. It's very atmospheric with fantastic use of light and shadow that creates such a creepy atmosphere, which is heightened even more by the use of close-ups in a very Hitchcockian fashion. Once the killer is revealed, things start happening a little too fast for my liking, but it still makes for compelling viewing. Do not miss it. And yeah, that is very, very true. It's, it's very clear. Like a lot of Danish filmmakers, you can, you know, you, you watch and it's like, oh wow, they really studied some of the classic movie directors. You know, it, it's, if you can fit a Fritz Lang reference into your movie, yeah, that, that really does show that you are familiar with the, the classics, you know. And I don't think I want to give away in the review itself. When, when I get into the, the spoilers, I'll, you know, yeah, I'll talk about that reference. <laughs> A Lannister on the Night Watch? Nicely done. And, let's see. There's something about the Night Watchman gig. It's not a glamorous one, but it's a job that has an air of mystery to it. As a member of the Night Watch, you're the one responsible if a group of hooligans come barging in for a bit of fun. If a specter comes haunting, you're the one who's going to have to call the Ghostbusters. Quick side note, I haven't watched the recent Ghostbusters movies. I, you know, the first one's good. I, I have a bit of a, you know, I, I, the second one's a guilty pleasure for, my, for me. I think the slime is very well used in, in that one. If neither of the new ones, at least once, have someone say, who you gonna text, Ghostbusters, I really think that's a missed opportunity. Anyway, back to the quote. A serial killer marks your location as his hunting ground. It's up to you to save the day. It's an occupation full of uncertainty. Let's see, and... Yeah, the um, yeah. One person points out Kim Botnia was pretty unlikable. I guess that's what he was supposed to be. There were times when it seems like he was trying a bit too hard. Yeah, I, I, they definitely push it. That, that's one of the big. I, I love Danish movies. I think we've made some incredible movies, but just a lot of times it get pu it gets pushed too far. You know, I, th I think we we excel at gritty social realism and we we used to make incredible comedies i uh, i haven't watched any recent danish comedy i like i'll hear about the cast i'll watch a trailer and it's just like i don't this is not appealing to me at all it, to be fair same goes for american comedies you know i i loved american comedies in like the 90s you know i think jim carrey did incredible work in the 90s not really interested in current day like I like to laugh, but I tend to prefer stand-up, and like, yeah, you know, slightly older stuff. Uh, anyway, yeah. So the the what was the other thing? Yeah, that um, yes. I think the the uh, comedies that we made back in like the the sixties and seventies. I think those really really worked well I, I i i don't know that we're that good at genre cinema i think whenever we try to make an action movie or a horror movie you know a lot of the times like it just it doesn't come out quite as well as uh, you know yeah just the the and and you know and and again Maybe some of the reasons, I've seen some recent trailers for like Danish action movies and they actually look pretty decent, you know. If I, you know, yeah. Maybe at some point I'll, I'll try to sit down and, and watch. But, yeah. Um, there's a lot of times where we'll just push things a little too far. Something that, you know, something will end up a little too silly or a little too like dark 
now let's see. Right, and and I thought this was a good a pretty quote. The, the story was a good whodunit mystery thriller. Whether or not I classify this as a full-blown horror movie is iffy. Sure, you could watch it on a Halloween night and get a kick out of it, but you just as soon see it on A&E Mysteries. Does that make it a bad movie? No, it just means that the audience is slightly different. And, yeah, it's, you know... Oh, that's right, yeah. Actually, you know, I was about to say uh, IMDb says it's not... Nope, IMDb does say thriller. And... Yeah, I mean, I can, I can somewhat understand the, the. Yeah, it, it. A lot of people are not gonna feel that it pushes far enough to be a full-on horror movie. Uh, right, one person said, "Not sure if the racism towards foreigners was necessary." Yeah, that really felt like. I at this point I would like to say I am not from Copenhagen. I am not going to make any excuses for there's some really screwed up people there. Not saying everyone, but some people just uh, yeah. And and yeah, it is the, you know sadly there is some uh, racism. You know, we we have a number of Muslim immigrants and sadly some people kind of act like, oh, well, if one of them has to, you know, and yeah, of course, you know, if you have enough, if a, if a group gets large enough, you're going to find at least someone who does something wrong, but, you know, the, the, yeah. Let's see. Right, one person says, towards the end, you are against the wall, clawing at the wallpaper out of sheer excitement. He says the U.S. remake is fifth rate. Wow. Yeah. Let's see. And but but yeah. Uh, in in some ways, it's a much more European movie than a, a lot of the American ones. But it also isn't quite up to like the horror standards of other European. You know. At the risk of, you know, I know the following is a cliche, but there's a lot of great Asian horror, which, you know, yeah, you wouldn't call it American, but it is much more consistently scary than this movie. And that is, a th like, yeah, I, I would, it is, you know, I would almost add comedy to the, to the you know, comedy thriller as, as, a, as a genre, because a number of the scenes here are funny and not even remotely thrilling and it seems we're like I don't know if the American remake did this but like you could easily rewrite a lot of these scenes to have like ooh you know this this is happening and the killer is watching you know but they don't instead it's just people you know it's yeah it's mostly it's these two couples you know which I just realized I haven't actually particularly so there's Nikolai Kostovaldau, who you may know from Game of Thrones, his character Martin Kimbotnias Jens are, are two friends. Mar Martin is with Kalinka, played by Sophie Kobel. And no, her last name was not written just to you know make it really difficult for Americans to type her name. And Lotte, played by Lord Anderson, is with Jens. And, yeah, a lot of scenes are one or more of these four. And, they're, you know, it's like I said, it's not, like, boring. But they're, like, doing stuff. You know, Kalinka is, like, I guess, is she studying to work at a theater? You know, act, she's an actress, you know, and... Yeah, and like you'll see her, you know, talk about oh, I gotta do lines, you know, not not lines like, but you know, practice lines, and uh, yeah, Lotte is like a priest, so sometimes they're talking about that, and you know, there's yeah, there's a scene where she says, you know, Sunday I'm gonna do the the very first, you know, uh, service, I guess it's called. 
not a Christian. So anyway, but yeah. Um, and yeah, a lot of these scenes, like you could see how you could really bringing the serial killer into this, but no, it's just, they're just doing stuff, and you get you know you get character moments, you get characterization, and like you know exploration of the themes. But yeah, like the the movie is not constantly trying to to scare and. Yeah, like it's a it's definitely a choice because when it goes for scaring, it pretty much always succeeds. So it's yeah, it's it's interesting that they did make this this choice. You know, and the the yeah, the scary stuff like you could easily it's not like budget. It's not like, oh, we spent all the effects budget on this one scene so we had to just pad out. It's not padding they did legitimately just not want to make every scene be because because a lot of the stuff that makes it scary is not stuff that's expensive now you know it's it's not like big effects shots or set pieces or that kind of thing for example and let's see oh that's right there's more than one there's multiple Fritz Lang references, so yeah, just, you know, let's see, and, um, right, right, and, and one person points out the, you know, yeah, and another major reference is, you know, student Martin takes the job in the morgue thinking it's just a form of paid studying, just like Jack Torrance thinks that being housekeeper, I don't think that's, anyway, you know, in the deserted Overlook Hotel is just a form of paid writing, you know, so yeah, both Jack and Martin get more than they are asking for, and let's see. Right, and one person says it takes a little while for the story to unfold, but the blood gets pumping towards the end. And let's see. Yeah, this is I I don't I'm not 100% certain if this person is like an American, but it kind of reads like an American, you know, it's certainly someone who's watched a number of American movies. So Anyway, yes, the lavish praise for this movie suggests that it was a very important film for its time and place. However, I find that Night Watch isn't a particularly tense thriller. The atmosphere of the morgue is interesting, there are some suspenseful moments, but the narrative is lacking. There aren't enough suspects to go around. For a good whodunit, there need to be many viable suspects. I wanted to keep guessing, but I couldn't. In addition, a lot of the drama is created by people bumbling around making bad choices, Instead of getting caught in an expertly woven net, the characters don't have much motivation for the things they do. An hour or so in, I didn't care what happened to them. The movie makes several joking references to cliches in Hollywood cinema, but doesn't seem that interested in breaking them. I wouldn't quite say like a lack of motivation, though I think ah, to, to an extent, there's definitely, you can tell that more than explore characters that made perfect sense and such, the movie really wants to explore the themes and the characters sometimes like jerk around awkwardly just to fit in the, the themes and that's definitely yeah. And the yeah, and and for for sure the the a lot of the drama comes from the the themes that they wanted to explore and how the the actually yeah I I think I've made my point about this right one person points out the current iteration of this film on DVDs in UK proudly claims on the cover that this is Hostel meets Seven. They may as well have written that it's The Social Network meets Weekend at Bernie's. It's about a student and involves dead bodies. I mention this up front in the hope of sparing those of lesser cynicism than I from being totally misled about the movie. 
Let's see. Yeah, and he points out the the opening twenty minutes are fantastic and truly, in, and the setup is truly inspired. He feels that it's squandered and doesn't really. Actually, to be fair, there's definitely some th some truth to that. Yeah. But yeah, Hostel meets Seven. No, that's that's not. I haven't watched Hostel, but I you know it has a reputation. This does not even remotely just yeah you know I'm I'm not particularly fond of of torture porn. I watched the first Saw, you know it's it's well made. I'm just I'm not particularly into it. You could yeah you could say the first Saw is this movie on steroids you know, and this movie is not trying to be hostile or Saw, and it also isn't trying to be Seven. Now, let's see. Right, and Martin's first night on the job where he's shown around by the outgoing guard is truly brilliant. Could have made a fantastic short. Yeah, I actually, I'm not 100% sure how Martin got the job because they seem to have, like, a certain, um, a bare minimum of, like, you have to be at least this creepy to work here. Yeah, I, I maybe he maybe he lied in the in the resume or something. I don't know. Every, literally everybody else who works there is is creepy and weird, which makes it a little funny that some of them think that he's creepy and weird. It's like I think you need a mirror, my fan, my, my dude. Just that's yeah. I meant to say friend there. It's mouth not cooperating. See. Right, and and one percent. Uh, there's some nasty set pieces, some genuine suspense, a couple of good chuckles, and yeah, uh, thin characterizations, and let's see. yeah, and and. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this per one person says, I'm not surprised this was remade by Hollywood, as the plot, characters, and dialogue already seem quite Hollywood influenced in this original, though with that careful European touch. And let's see. Yeah, one person found the movie, a lot of the movie, to be slow and Hockey. And that definitely is how some people will feel about it. And yeah, uh, says there were maybe 15 minutes filled with scary going ons. And yeah, it it is. Yeah, and let's see. Um. I. Th I think that might be about... Right, uh, yeah, one person says, The first act is highly entertaining. It goes into a second act that becomes a bit cloudy. The restaurant scene is quite painful. The third act is full of suspense, causing one as a viewer to worry about the characters. The cinematography gives a conventional air during the day scenes, and the night scenes give a sense of tension. The camera movements are a delight. Soundtrack is quite effective, especially in suspenseful scenes. Let's see. And I think that might be more or less it for that. And Yeah, one person points out, you know, it's, you know, just because it's not an American horror movie doesn't mean that it's automatically, like, amazing. Let's see, the... And... I think that is more or less. 
Yeah, so the... Right, and yeah, some people point out if you don't speak Danish, you know, watching this with English subtitles, uh, you know, they they definitely miss some things in the the dialogue. Let's see. Right, this is a really good point. This guy Ulbonade plots like a devil. The way he sets everything up is masterful. The script is so tight, practically every element that's established is later on used. Reminded me of early Coen Brothers scripts. Absolutely true. It's one of those movies, like, it's not, like, the best thing ever made, but there are some... Yeah, it's, it's just... Some people praise it to high heaven and some people say ah that was you know nothing impressive and I, just, I feel like the truth it's it's closer to you know praise it to high heaven than than absolutely nothing but you know some of the reviewers do manage to to very accurately assess it but yeah a lot of people a lot of the reviewers just yeah go in either of those directions and yeah it's just I don't think it's the, it's the most useful for those who haven't already watched it. You know, I haven't I only read reviews of it after already watching it. Uh, right, and this critic goes on to say, it also provides the viewer with sufficient food for thought. What with the underlying themes about the connection between sex and death, man's self-destructive tendencies versus his instincts for survival and self-preservation, and more. That's exact. yes, 100% agreed, and that's the thing that I wish that some of these people who are like, ah, oh, this is so boring. I mean, it's not, it's not boring the way that, like, There's actually, there's there's depth there. There's something for you to, to think about, you know. But if you're used to watching American movies that aren't trying, then watching a European movie that's like trying but not trying to, to top American ones, yeah, you might miss things like that. And it's, you know, it's too bad. And I think... I think that might... Right, um, let's see... Um, yes, this is a, a quite good... Uh, oh, right, right, and uh, yeah, one, one person says, you know, oh, Danish seems like a fascinating language to learn. Tell you what, let's, let's start small. If you can say that ten times fast, I'm full of shit. That is not the easiest thing to say. Anyway, let's see. Uh, Martin is busy studying for his law degree. To make ends meet, he gets himself a nice little job as a night watchman in a morgue. Bar work may be a bit more lively, but to each, each to their own. I mean, I realize that's probably a joke, but... I mean, he intends to study there. He's still a student, and, you know, he figured, like, if he's if he's working in a bar, he's not going to be able to study at the same time. Anyway, his brief training consists of the old night watchman showing him the ropes. He has to vi visit each room, take a key that is chained to the wall, insert it into this little machine to prove that he has done the rounds. To get to the key in the morgue, he has to walk past rows of cadavers. Bar work still seems like the better option to me, but let's give it a chance. Finally, he is shown a large red light in his office. This is the emergency alarm. Above each bed in the morgue is a pull cord. If one of the bodies just so happens to wake up, the startled person can pull the cord, and the red light starts to pulse, accompanied by a loud siren. No, don't think the job suits. It's the lamb and flag for me. And, and yeah, this, like... Right there, you know, you immediately know that something is going to happen when he goes the rounds. You know that there's going to be, you know, who knows, maybe at some point the alarm will go off. You know, there's just, yeah, but it works, you know, you, you watch it and, and you know, and, and this is something I think is is sometimes underappreciated. You know, I, I acknowledge that it can be scary if something comes out of the blue. 
but if you set something up, build towards it, and then have like a, a big shock, you know, hit, yeah, that's very Hitchcockian. That can be extremely effective, and yeah, that's that's something that I think this does much better than a lot of American, like a lot of slashers from the 80s that are American, for example. And I think that is gonna right. So yeah, a couple of things. Um, the IMDb trivia s points out this is the film debut of Nikolai Costa-Valta, which yeah, that that is it is cool. That I'm I'm really glad he's still working. Um, haven't watched Game of Thrones, but yeah, I have seen him in other stuff, and it's actually it's it's. It's a, a fun bit of, you know, several of the major, you know, you know, Ul Bondale and several of the major actors in this have, since this, actually gone on to appear in, like, American stuff. You know, Ul Bondale directed the American remake of this. Yeah, Nikolai Costa-Valdau, well-known internationally now. And... Ulrich Thompson appears in like, you know, he doesn't have a lot of screen time here, but yeah, you know, he is actually in this, and he's also like internationally known now, so yeah, that's very cool, and in Denmark, the film was so successful that it ended up making more money in the country than Jurassic Park did, which is kind of funny, and, and it is like... Yeah, I just you know we we do love American movies here, but sometimes we just like something that's you know more relatable and and kind of just yeah you know I'm not gonna claim that this is better than Jurassic Park at least you know, in the amount of dinosaurs it shows. Otherwise, it's yeah. I'm kidding. Anyway, let's see. Right, right. And the yeah, there's a picture in the in the the Night Watch room. It's Lewis Thornton Powell, Lewis Payne, a co-conspirator in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And yeah, um, unfortunately, the film influenced the number of Danish organ. What is that? The bequ bequests to the medical anatomy. Anatomical Institute, Panem Institute, and yeah, by May of '97, over 100 people had withdrawn their organ wills. That is legitimately a sad response. I, I wish that they had been informed how fictitious this film is. It absolutely does not. Yeah. Um, so I'm just real quick gonna put this in the spoiler section because it is something I want to talk about but it is also a spoiler so let's see there we go oh hold on there we go oh right and this is the debut of Reiki Louise Anderson Right, who plays Joyce. And... Right, and and according to Wikipedia, Bonadale began writing the script for Nightwatch after the release of his television film Master Vader. He was inspired to make the movie after a trip he made to a morgue in Copenhagen. He stated in an interview, I went to this morgue in a city of one million people and it was both scary and beautiful. It made me think about how outside there is this daily life going on and suddenly you're standing in a cellar realizing this is where it all ends. It makes you think about life and how you're living it. And that really comes across in the the finished movie. And and that's the thing, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, oh, you know, they could easily rewrite a lot of these scenes to have the serial killer, you know, he's he's watching them or he's like, you know. But that wasn't, you know, the the thing that the movie is meant to be about is, you know, 
thinking about life and how you're living it. And yeah, like I, I don't know that Bonadale, I could imagine he could easily have written the, the script to be more about the serial killer. But yeah, I mean, I don't think he, he was, you know, the, the obviously the moment that like serial killer thrillers was the kind of thing, you know, if he was going to make a horror, a, a movie that is horror, or approaches being horror, yeah, based on the, the time it was made, that meant it was going to be in part about a serial killer, but it didn't start with that. That was something that was added in, and sometimes you can kind of tell watching it. Bonadale also wrote much of the script at night, he states. I was writing the story at night in an office all by myself, sometimes until four in the morning. I didn't dare go to my car because I would have to walk through all these dark hallways. And that again, you really see that in some of the morgue scenes, this thing with, you know, hey, when he does his rounds. Let's see, which, ah, I forget the exact, I think they say it's like once once per hour or something like that. Let's see, and... Yeah, so the... the Yeah, the editing and cinematography, with only a handful of exceptions, are inspired using light and darkness immensely well, early terrifying the audience. Marvelously well shot movie. Let's see... And yeah, the 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 plot definitely does have some details that strain credulity. Still, this is exciting and creepy whenever it attempts to be. The relatable story, credible, well developed human characters are the driving force of the movie. In between the sequences of suspense to keep it from overstimulating the audience, there's humor. Every joke and gag are funny. None fall flat or try too hard. See, while there are jump scares, most of the buildup pays off big time. The music is excellent, contains a good bit of rock, as well as a cue that they must have composed with Psycho in mind. There's a lot of disturbing content, some sexuality, including dialogue, brief nudity, and a little bloody violence in this. The DVD comes with a well-done half-hour-long behind-the-scenes featurette that covers the majority of the areas of production and the theatrical trailer. And... See, yeah, the the um, I did have one. What was right, right? Um, about the the nudity. Um, I think was some. Yeah, yeah. There's there's some male nudity, also, and you know some. Yeah, if you're used to watching American movies and you sit down to watch this, you know, just be aware, like. We have a much more relaxed, especially back then. I, you know, today it's maybe a little more, you know, but but we're nowhere near as, we're, you know, yeah, we're not hugely Puritan here. So yeah, nudity is not necessarily going to be treated like this, you know, huge thing. That was an un, that was a Freudian slip. Now, considering his work in Bleeder and Pusher. There's a certain logic to Kim Botnia being all about pushing boundaries here. And it is kind of interesting seeing him play this much more, like, maybe bleeder also, but pusher, he's much more, like, like, he's downright unpleasant. You know, he is a, a pusher. He is a, a drug dealer in that. Right, but, yeah, y'all don't call those pushers, do you? It's It's... It's one of those things, like, when I first learned, you know, okay, so America calls them drug dealers, we call them pushers, but pusher is an American word. Why did we take an American word, but not their word, instead of just making up our own word for, for that kind of thing? Anyway, but yeah, you know, he's he's unpleasant and very, very intense in that movie, and here, he's like, like when I when I was doing research for this video... I literally for I had forgotten that that was Kim Botnia in this movie. Like I remembered the character, but like when I think about Kim Botnia, yeah, like Pusher and Bleeder are the movies I think about. So yeah, 
where a lot of American movies get the scares from things that happen, this gets them from the technical aspects. The flickering lights and otherwise dim lighting of the hallways of the forensic department, the tense music using string instruments, the enjoyably over-enthusiastic sound design, the camera work and editing, and where American movies dealing with serial killers from this time had a lot of kills, gore, and the like, this one doesn't actually seem that interested in the serial killer so much as using the serial killer to explore nihilism and cynicism. The 90s were a very cynical time, and these themes are also explored in the game of Dare, which this has about equal interest in as the, the killer. And, you know, the, both are introduced very early on, and there's a number of scenes that focus on the... on. There's probably more scenes of the game of Dare than of, like, the the whole thing with the, the serial killer. And, uh, right, I, I had some thoughts about the... the so, yeah, the behind-the-scenes, you know, if you're buying this on DVD, you know, double-check to make sure that it's on. I can imagine there's probably a DVD out there that has no special features. But, yeah, the 28 and a half minute behind-the-scenes, it's well-made, you know, considering it's from the early days of DVD, it's not really a surprise or slight that it is quite basic. The inexperienced but talented writer-director even admits that though he is trying to render the characters relatable to the audience, he does not yet know how to put that into words for the interview. It is an interesting featurette, but by today's standards, it really doesn't contain anything that is not already considered standard. A lot of it's general information, rather than diving deep into the specific film, which would, of course, have increased its long-term appeal, but I'm not sure they expected it to be as big a deal. You know, I'm, I'm sure when they were making this, they had no idea that there would be an American remake, and, like, you know, it would be... Yeah, you know, this, this big, you know, like I mentioned, Kim Butnia is in this. I, I, I forgot, and I'm, I'm a fan of his. I think he does amazing in, in Pusher, Bleeder, you know, just, yeah, like he's, he's, oh, and he's actually also internationally known. He was on The Witcher. Very cool. Now, let's see, but but yeah, you know, they decided to focus on the general, and again, at the time, that was becoming a thing. When, you know, when this movie was made, they didn't even make DVDs yet. Uh, you know, it was harder to find behind-the-scenes secrets. Like, originally, it was almost definitely just meant to be shown on TV, you know, the the because it clearly was made while they were making the movie, uh, you know, but... Yeah, it would have been great if they were talking about, okay, so for this scene, I was thinking that, you know, and they do, they talk a little bit about specific scenes, but a lot of it is just, you know, and it is very cool. Like, you know, if you've never watched, like, okay, even if you have, you know, I've I've seen a lot of, I, ah, I can't believe I'm blanking on the, the word, hold on, um, the, um, Foley work, you know, yeah, it's it's fun to, to watch them do the Foley work, you know. And the, the featurette is also slightly hurt by the Danish culture of confidence being seen as a negative, basically a sign of arrogance. There's a Danish saying, who do you think you are? We call it Jentelon. So a lot of us are not great for this kind of thing. It's the same for some of the behind-the-scenes for the Hitman games. I saw a number of, you know, featurettes on the Hitman Blood Money where, in many of them, they're kind of wishy-washy. They don't want to fully, you know, go into how they, they did these things, you know, how they did things and the cool things they put in the game. You know, essentially, we express ourselves through the movies and video games and such. We produce more than these interviews, you know. It's... And I realize that that's you know might seem counterintuitive as someone who makes you know thousands of YouTube videos uh, you know talking at at great lengths, but you know what can I say? I you know there are certain reasons I have a lot of of confidence for for this sort of thing, but yeah, a number of a number of other Danish people, 
you know, they're, they can be incredibly talented at, you know, filmmaking or video game development, but they're not great. And it is also the kind of, like, it is kind of silly that we even expect, like, you know, if you're a director or you're, like, you work on video games and you're used to, like, sitting and, and doing stuff on a computer, yeah, you're not necessarily going to be great when people shove a microphone and in your face and point a camera directly at, you know, I do this to myself. This was my choice. Nobody has ever tried for, you know, there was a petition circling to try to talk me out of it. More than one, ah, crap, what are they called? Intervention attempts, you know, but I'm too stubborn to quit. Uh, no, I love doing this. Yeah, the, the opening of the movie does a really great job setting up, like, it, it actually, the very, very opening of the movie is this, like, the the camera, there's a long shot, it's maybe two minutes, where, like, it'll pan across, you know, you see, like, the, the pictures they have on the wall, and, you, you know, just various, you know, so you get an introduction to the four characters through that. And, yeah, so I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending. Uh, the ending does fit what came before. I think it's fine. Uh, some reviewers absolutely hate it and felt the, you know, the movie was great until it reached the ending. Now, I think that is... Pretty much. Um, yeah, that is what I am going to say about that. That brings us to. So yeah, some of, some of the dialogue is very. Like you can tell, they they were they had some information they had to get across. And now there are two entries in the IMDb quote section. One of them is good, the other is bad. I suppose I can get into in the... Let's see. Honestly, the one that's bad, it's maybe more the fact that, like... Trying to be mean, but it does sound a little. It, it comes across. It comes across as a, a Danish person who maybe doesn't have the best grasp on English, trying to translate the the Danish dialogue into English, and it doesn't completely sound right. Now I. I think that is maybe. right. They get some great use out of uh, some location shooting. The the um, I'm they might have actually had like some access to a morgue. Maybe it was like a set, but it looks incredibly convincing, certainly. And yeah, just like details, the like the fact that the lights. Are like flickering and this thing like you kind of get you know it's this thing of oh you know maybe nobody who like maybe every so often the night watch will say can we fix the flickering light I have to deal with this every night and the rest of them are like whatever you say I'm you know I'm home by the time you have to deal with that so you know whatever and yeah, just these nice long hallways that you have to walk down and the the sort of fluorescent light, you know, just it's it's very unpleasant the the morgue itself. And yeah, so the movie is 101 minutes without credits and 103 with and I would say the first 
watch the first 35 minutes if by then you really don't care what's going to happen to the characters or with the mystery yeah you can go ahead and turn it off and yeah so the the best element of the movie is the exploration of the the themes tied with the some of the the really scary scenes and and the fact that like yeah, like, there's not that much violence and gore, and it still manages to be very, very, like, creepy. Let's see. The worst aspect is probably that the mystery is ultimately a little too easy to solve on your own. There's, there's too few suspects, and some of the information we get just kind of... Like I mentioned, you know, you can probably figure out what the what the twist is before the movie reveals it. And yeah, so something you know, others criticized, you know, it gave a bad name to doctors, and that is, yeah, very very frustrating and just yeah. Um, so yeah, the thing I was most worried about was the banes of Danish films. Bad writings, things either having zero consequences or excessive consequence. And yeah, there is a little bit of that. You know, I mentioned, you know, like everyone who works at this, you know, the, the forensic department, you know, near the morgue, everyone there is creepy and weird. And, you know, that that's the thing, like at one point, Ole Bonadale figured that's going to make the movie more effective. That's going to make it uh, scarier. If every time you're there, like, you you know, there's not that many people there. But occasionally, you know, Martin has to call someone. And there's a certain logic to that. But then at another point, he real he figured... They should, like, the people who work there should think that Martin is weird. And then he didn't stop and say, wait, those two contradict each other. I have to change one of them. And so we just end up with this movie that, yeah, it just doesn't completely, that aspect doesn't completely work. Now, uh, the things we're most looking forward to was the cast and the direction, and the movie absolutely exceeded expectations. The trailer does give at least a little too much away, uh, but it does also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. And I do think the trailer is worth watching. You should maybe watch it after watching the movie. And it is, you know, it's difficult to make a good trailer for a horror movie. How do you not give too much away? The cover and poster arguably give... Yeah, the... the Yes, the cover and poster give at least a little too much away also. And they, they do a decent job giving you an idea of what the movie is like, as much as just a still image can. Now, this has a 60% on Rotten Tomatoes based on five reviews, three fresh, two rotten. The average score was 5.60 out of 10. 80% from audiences with over 1,000 ratings, 3.8 out of 5 being the average rating, and, um, right, there are no, the, the two, oh, hold on, there's a link, and it's dead, a dead link. Yeah, I, I would quote from the two rotten reviews, but there are no, there are no words. I can understand why some people felt it was disappointing after seeing 80% from audiences. And it's not on Metacritic at all. On IMDb, there are 44 user reviews, 41 if you hide spoilers. Don't mean to brag, but my own old 2009 text review is the second, you know, second to most popular of, and the, let's see, yeah, so the, of, of those user reviews, right, and I, I read all of them, 
of them, zero gave it one out of ten, one gave it two, nobody gave it three, one gave it four, two gave it five, four gave it six, six gave it seven, ten gave it eight, nine gave it nine, and three gave it ten. So largely it was very positively received. And let's see, what was the thing with it won ten awards and was nominated for an additional two. So yeah, the the let's see, uh, Nikolai Kostovalda was nominated. Ricky Luis Anderson did win. Uh, Bondale won for direction. Kim Botnia won. Uh, Ricky Luis Anderson won another one. Because it's Denmark, our awards are called Bodil and Robert. Or Robert, if you want to be that way about it. And um, it won for editing, makes a lot of sense. And makeup, yeah, 100% makes sense. And uh, let's see. That is. Yeah, Bonadale won a bunch and was nominated for a couple he didn't. Right, I just realized I did not mention. So the the cinematography was by Dan Lausen, who has 63 completed and three upcoming credits as DP. And yeah, he DP'd John Wick Chapter 4. So his career is doing well. The editing Camilla, by Camilla Skolson, uh, she has 47 credits as editor. Last in 2018, and nothing coming up. So, And then you have the... Right, the music... Um, oh, did they just list all the artists who contributed? Okay, here we go, yeah. So the composer for this is Joachim Holbeck. 45 credits as composer and oh, he, com he composed for the new oh, that's right, yeah, they did make a recent yeah, yeah, apparently oh, I don't actually know if it's new though. Yeah, he, he composed for The Kingdom, Real our excellent original, not the garbage American version. I don't even, like, I don't want to make a big deal out of it. I didn't watch all of it. I watched some of the American one. I just, I think that it's baffling that they take, like, you know why it's called the kingdom or real? That's because it takes place at the the. Uh, let's see how to best translate it. It's it's this Danish hospital called Rishospital or the hospital of the kingdom. The kingdom refers to the hospital. How do you make an American version? when America has never been a kingdom. It's just like, right off the bat, at least change the title. Like, America has well-known hospitals, like internationally known hospitals. Just change the title. It doesn't have to be the the kingdom hospital. Just, yeah. And, and, you know, it's not like a royal hospital. It's not where only the royals go. When, you know, it's... I, I think it might be the biggest hospital we have, and... Yeah, sometimes we name big things here after the fact that we are a kingdom, you know. The, yeah. Let's see. But but yeah, so he is still working also, so that's great. And then, um, yeah, this... Let's see. Yeah, they, ju they listed some artists. Yeah, that's. I appreciate the enthusiasm, but I think music by is mainly for like the the main composer, not like the people who. 
what you, what you want to do is add it to soundtracks, which I think they also did. I think, yeah, so, you know, that's also a thing, you know, if you, if you listen to this and you're like, I gotta listen to that music, you know, there's some of the, some of the music is on the MDB soundtrack page. Uh, let's see, so yeah, four, like, major ones, and then this, like, this old kind of light song that is something that, ah, what's the word? It's basically, I, I think it might be like a children's song, and it's like, used to creepy effect, you know. But yeah, there's some really, really great rock music in the movie, and... At least some of them, possibly all of them, are listed in the MDB soundtracks page. Now, the the special effects are quite good. Uh, like I mentioned, there's not a huge amount of it, but what there is is quite good. And thankfully, they don't try to push it too far. They they don't try to do something with effects that they couldn't convincingly do. There's a couple of times where instead of showing a thing, we will get an implication of something happening and we're scared because of the implication and because of the excellent Foley work and let's see that is it so so yeah um, I rate this eight scary night watching experiences out of ten and yeah, it, it holds up like it's, you know, you, you have to watch it with realistic expectations. Uh, you know, like, like I mentioned, they did not, I don't think they were making this figuring, you know, a bunch of international viewers are going to check this movie out. But, you know, it got popular, it got big, got an American remake. You know, there's a lot of movies that got an American remake where... You know, you can go back and watch the original, and you kind of, you have to adjust your, your expectations, you know. But, but yeah, you know, it's, it's a truism that usually the original is better. You know, I, I, I only know a few remakes that are better than the original. The, the thing 1982 is, but it's almost less of a remake and more of a readaptation of the short story, and... You know, I recommend the short story. I recommend the 1982 one. I I respect what the the original does. I think there's some very impressive things. It's just baffling to me that it doesn't play on the paranoia when like the short story does. And you know, it was the Cold War. There was a lot of paranoia, and I, f I forget. I think it's like a couple of years later. They made the original uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yeah, the the yeah the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers is from 1956. The original The Thing is from 1951. So it wouldn't have been a ripoff of the original Body Snatchers. Just yeah. I wholeheartedly recommend the 1956 Invasion of the Body Snatchers. The Thing from Another World is well made, but I really don't think it is. Oh, wow, I forgot. Yeah. Um, the original The Thing has a 7.1 on IMDb. The original Invasion of the Body Snatchers has a 7.7. .7. I think that helps explain the... the yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. Uh, I can also imagine this is a movie that, you know, people are going back and rewatching now to, you know, prepare for the, the sequel or maybe go back and watch after the sequel comes out. And, yeah, I think a lot of those people are going to like it a lot. And I just realized I didn't even mention Scream, so I'm going to briefly... the I did already mention that it references... American films, you know, it, it's, the, there are times where the characters will say, if this was a movie, or this is like a movie, and that's, of course, very Scream, and, and yes, this did predate Scream, but Scream didn't just pop out out of nowhere, you know, it was, like, the 90s were a time when every young person had watched movies, 
you know, in a, in a way that, like, for, for a very long time, American movies, at least, basically pretended, like, movies don't exist, you know, like, the, the, a couple of them do, I'm not gonna claim, but there were a number of them that kind of just, because, because it is a thing, it's, it's risky, if you call attention to the fact that something is fake, which a movie is, you know, it's like a documentary is less fake, but it's, you know, still some staging going on. But a movie, you know, like you sit and watch and you, you see, you know, a small handful of people experience something, but, you know, if you know the behind the scenes, well, it wasn't just that small, you know, they were surrounded by a movie crew Everything was carefully staged and pre you know prepared, and they wrote the script. You know all these things, but yeah, by the '90s, you know people were ready to have movies that talked about movies. So yeah, you know this does that. Scream does that, and that's another thing where like the first Scream. You know if you haven't gone back and watched in a while treat yourself, you know, unless it's just not your thing, which is fine. Since you're watching this video, there's a chance that it might be your thing. That movie does an excellent job. Like, it, it I kind of wish that it didn't use, you know, a lot of the time when it says horror, it means slasher. But other than that, you know, just that there's a couple of times where it gets a little confused. Not confusing, but confused. But that movie does a really great job, like, using this, you know, meta-textual kind of thing of, of, you know, we've all, you know, every young person has watched a horror movie by the 90s, and the, the you know, if you found yourself in a situation that resembled a horror movie, you know, the, the kinds of... Yeah, you know, people would talk about it in a in a cynical way, as if it were a movie. And, yeah, Scream does a really great job with that. And this movie didn't really need to bring up movies at all. You know, it's, it's essentially, like, by the end of the movie, you realize why they, they did it. You know, it wasn't just... It wasn't that there was no reason for it. But the movie, you know, if you watch it after Scream, you might think, oh, it's going to do something with it, and it doesn't really. It's just a, it's a, it's an element, but it's not something that the movie is built around the way Scream is. And, yeah, that brings us to the thought section. So, the rest of this video contains spoilers and uh, yeah you know from here on it's thoughts so yeah series of thoughts some of this analysis some of this msc 3 k riff tracks and other jokes uh, let's see and yeah so the first section is thoughts that i had while watching chronological order you can think of it as a running commentary live tweeting or the like and the section after that is thoughts i had before watching but yeah, let us get into the notes taken while watching on paper, as per usual. So yeah, um, yeah, the opening long shot does a really great job. You know, you see like there's a there's at least one picture of I can't believe I'm blanking on their names already. Uh, hold on. Oh, that was not what I meant to click. Hold on. Okay, you can let go now. Uh, yes, Martin Kalinka, and Kalinka, you see, you know, and and um, you know, you see like dirty dishes saying, "Oh, they're you know, they're celebrating right now, or not celebrating, but they're they're having dinner right now," and just yeah, nice little things that that just help paint a picture of the people and their relationships and there's a very clear tension you know the this throughout the movie of this thing of you know before you reach your thirties and once you reach them you know where 
Jens will, uh, you know, the, the, you know, they're talking, the, you know, the, the text is they're talking about the, the, um, what they're gonna do on the, you know, to celebrate Martin's birthday. And I gotta say, maybe it's a Copenhagen thing. I don't know anyone who's ever called Trivial Pursuit just trivial, but, I mean, I guess, yeah, they were talking about what they're gonna do, so it stands to reason. Anyway, and, you know, for the, for the subtitles, the person didn't just write trivial, but Trivial Pursuit, which is, yeah. Let's see, the, the, but, but yeah, you know, so, yeah, Martin says, it's my birthday, I get to decide. And Jens responds, you're only 24, you're not old enough to make any decisions, you know, and there, that helps, uh, yeah, that exchange sets up this tension between the idea that, you know, once you reach 30, and, you know, Jens even says, we don't know how to party anymore. Nobody knows how to party anymore. Nobody at age 30 knows how to party. Yeah, yeah. The actual line as written and spoken is nobody age 30 knows how to party anymore. But the subtitles just say nobody, period, knows how to party anymore, which is a pretty significant omission there anyway. But yeah, you know, you, you see that throughout the movie. That's the, you know, the game of dare is like this thing of, you know, we're running, you know, Jens says, you know, we're betting our freedom, you know, if, if the, you know, because yeah, you know, they feel like there is this, you know, what, what is, is life already over? You know, is, are, are they really going to be boring already kind of thing? And yeah. Let's see. And I appreciate, you know, it's clearly a fun party until the new job comes up. You know, then, you know, Martin, to the new job. And Lot is like, I can't believe you're really going to do it. It's disgusting, you know, kind of just, and, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and the, the old, you know, Gurt Lüfqvist, R.I.P. Holy crap, dude. He, he only died at age 90. That's, yeah. Very, very, that's, that's not bad. Um, anyway, yeah, he, um, you know, he explains all the ins and outs of the, of the place. We never do find out, do we? He's he's ha he asks, didn't they tell you about me? Why I'm quitting? Okay, we never. I don't think we ever do find out what it is that made him quit. You know, at first, like I I knew I I remembered that there was something about necrophilia in the movie, so I was like, oh, was he caught? But no, he explains. You know, years ago, someone did. You know, necrophilia. But yeah, you know, welcome to Mars. At night, this place is like Mars. I don't know why they put a key in the morgue itself. I think it's forced tension. And yeah, he explains about the alarm. And he keeps insisting, you know, the, you know, you you know you can keep the thing, but I'm taking my radio. You're gonna have to get your. I'm I'm gonna be studying. Get yourself a radio, and you know, yeah, he does end up glad that he got a radio, that he doesn't have to sit in complete silence. Let's see. And Martin, you know, asks Kalinka, why are there no idiots in your world? You know, she's. And and it is like a lot of a lot of young men, like it's there's a again there's a tension there like on some in a way he admires that she she can't imagine anyone being a bad person which is of course also why she gets so devastated later when when she hears about Joyce, but the the ah, let's see. 
you know, but yeah. So on one, uh, you know, he somewhat admires it, but on the other hand, he's also like, one of these days, she's gonna realize, you know, sh she's gonna see me the way I see me. She's not gonna think that I'm so great because she's so, you know, she's so sweet. I don't deserve her kind of thing. And uh, you know, the the yeah, he tries to. You know, he's like, what would you say if I loved you? If I said I love you? And, you know, she's like, well, how, you know, depends on how you say it. You know, and, and he points out, you know, why can't we just say that anymore? Why does that feel weird to say? And that's, again, this cynicism and nihilism of the 90s. And he points out, you know, we've, you know, we, we watch too many bad movies. Okay, I'll have you know. I'm just kidding. And I I gotta say, really, really appreciate, I don't know if it was a screenwriting decision or an editing decision, but, you know, I, I guess it's just, it's, I think it's only the second time we see him, we see Martin at the job, you know, the doctors leave and flip a switch to turn off the light, and the music, which, you know, I, I forget, what is the word for okay never mind I cannot at all recall uh, but there's like a you know I it feels like oh the music is like the you know because this is this is before the radio this is before he brings in his own radio so you know it seemed like oh the music is for the audience's benefit it's not that anyone in the movie is listening to it so when it just when the mu music stops when someone flicks a light, it flicks a, a switch. You know, it it makes you, you know, immediately you you take notice. Let's see, yeah, oh, oh right, the was it maybe that the, yeah, I'm not sure it's, it makes logical sense. Were they listening to radio and then he starts his own radio? And anyway, I yeah, I don't think it's you know. And, you know, we hear something and it's like, oh, is the alarm? Oh, it's just the timer. And let's see. Um, right, and, the, yeah, he, he leaves after, you know, that's also great. You know, he has to, like, put on blinders to, to walk up to the, the key in the morgue. And, you know, he forgot about the light, which is also, you know, why do I have to turn off the light and the old guy, you know, and that's, you know, just maybe it's because I just recently rewatched all of the Olsen gang films, but just immediately, you know, I just want the guy to say, communist, no respect for the old ways, kind of just, yeah. Let's see. And, and, you know, for Martin to be like, so where can I, where can I sleep? And yeah, the the dare the game of dare is set up. I appreciate the detail that they're not even remotely paying attention in class. And the idea is also brought up of if Martin would cheat on Kalinka. And the yeah, so the the scene in the bar. <laughs> um, the the two the two characters who who are walking around uh, you know basically like trying to start a bar fight are rule one and rule two and that's like the the word the direct translation of that word is root and I, you know it's essentially it's like with a weed how if you don't pull it out at the root it's gonna keep bugging you. I th I think that's the base, you know, because it's, yeah, it's not otherwise, you know, it is, yeah, you know, it's someone who causes trouble, is is what that, you know, and yeah, uh, Martin and Jens absolutely don't help Kenny and Lauda, which is like, thanks, what like what just yeah, and the. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, and and you have the the racism, which you know it's one thing that the 
uh, one and two are racist. I didn't really feel like Jens had to be and misogynistic uh, too. And it's one of those things where like, okay, so he goes up and you know fires off this, you know, yeah, just keep he keeps trying to verbally provoke, and eventually. Ulrich Thompson hits him a couple of times, and then that's it. And it's like, based on what he said, you would figure it would be like a massive beatdown. You know, it like the kind of thing that you see in Bleeder and Pusher and that kind of thing. You know, so it's, yeah, it, it's one of those things of just, you know, no consequences despite a, a massive, you know, I'm not going to repeat what he said, but just, yeah. And and then we get the, the one of the two memorable quotes. Right, y'all call him, we call him H.C. Anderson. Y'all call him Hans Christian Anderson. I gotta say, the, the first time that I dealt with, like, a tourist, I was like, Hans Christian, oh, oh, you mean H.C. Anderson. Oh, sure, yeah. Let's see, but, but, yeah, um... Martin says, Hans Christian Andersen, every time he masturbated, he wrote a little X in his diary, and Jens responds, if I had written an X every time I had masturbated, there wouldn't be any pencils left in the whole wide world, which is, yeah, that's, that's kind of funny. Right, and the, the briefly, the other thing, yeah, the other quote, just to get it out of the way, you know, when Verma talks to him, and to, to Jens, you know, right before, you know, yeah, he, he handcuffs him and, and um, you know, see, what I would, I forget exactly what the, what the, um, what the English subtitles, because I did watch this with English subtitles, there, there weren't any Danish ones on the DVD, um, I forget exactly what it said. But yeah, what is what is written on in the IMDb quote section is, "Have you ever tried getting killed?" And I mean, personally, I would probably. It just feels more natural if it's something like, "Have you ever been murdered?" Tried getting killed. It kind of sounds like they just, you know copy pasted it into Google Translate or something. Anyway, um, that brings us to... Yeah, and Jens says, you know, he, he hates all this pressure, all this, you know, stability. And, yeah, talks about Joyce and... Martin is caught dancing in the chair, which is kind of funny. And yeah, 31 minutes in, he meets Verma. Now, he already saw him on the TV talking about the, the serial killer. And Verma pushes him to check the boxes, which, you know, when you think back to it later, after you realize that he's the killer, it's like, yeah, of course he did. You know, he... Yeah. He, you know, he himself likes seeing that kind of thing, and the actual alarm does go, and you know, uh, the the alarm is going. Oh, well, check that it's false. Are you sure it's false? Of course it's false. You know, it's late. Yeah, and let's see. Um. Yeah, and then the, you know, he finds the, the body, checks the, the tank, you know, and, and the thing is like like a pendulum, you know, so you can clearly tell, okay, that was definitely where the, the alarm was pulled. And, you know, checks the tank and says, hi, Martin, and then Jens, you know, at first we don't know it's him, but just sits up and... Just, which is also like, I, I saw several people say, you know, it, it seems like the movie is going to be about, like, zombies, you know, at, at times with the, the rising bot, and you see the bloody footprints later with the, you know, that one uh, corpse, you know, and it, 
it is a little weird that that it feels like it's setting you know there's a there's a setup and a reminder and then no payoff you know there's there are no zombies in this movie which is fine you know not every movie needs to have zombies you know probably be better if they did but not every movie needs to have zombies i respect that but it just feels weird that it keeps appearing as yeah Let's see. And and you know, of course, he has to explore. You know, he has to come up with a reason why, for for the doctor, other than telling him. You know, and and he, you know, it is kind of funny that he, you know, apparently like. I stood and I stared directly at you for five minutes, and you didn't realize I was here. Which just yeah. And yeah, you know, the doctor offers a sedative in case just yeah. And we get the restaurant scene. Smile. Okay, Kilgrave. That was, yeah. Um, you know, I, I uh, there's a, a really great quote. Let's see. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the characters is unbearable. This is a critic quote. One of the characters is unbearable. The notorious Yentz in the scene in the restaurant with the prostitute makes me sick. This bur bourgeois student really demeans this girl thanks to the power of his dough. Seeing him humiliate this human being while taking out his banknotes is one of the most despicable scenes I've seen in years. And that does not make the hero who's watching nicer either. Besides, guess who will be sacrificed when the others survive? And yeah, as yeah, really, really unnecessary. I, I, I feel the movie did push it too far and you know huh I actually I would have guessed that Bornadale himself was in his 20s but he was let's see he, okay so he, he was 35 the year it came out so he was in his, his 30s when writing and directing it yeah um let's see. And let's see. Yeah, and and yeah, Joyce explains that you know one of the one of her clients wanted you know he paid her a thousand to so you know to pretend necrophilia. And yeah, you know, forty-five minutes in, we have all the information to solve the, you know, because yeah, she says, you know, one of the client, one of my clients paid me to fake necrophilia. One of my friend's clients scalped, you know, yeah, scalped her. So, you know, it's pretty easy to put two and two together and say, okay, so that's kind of sounds like it that you're talking about the same person, the. For, for both, and, you know, oh, you know, necrophilia, you mean like the guy who used to work at the morgue, and the moment we meet, we met Verma, Verma, he says, I used to work here. You know, like, it's it's pretty easy to piece together that he is the, the that he is a necrophilia, even just from that line, but later when we hear, you know, the, because we already know that the serial killer scalps his victims, but the fact that there was a connection between ne the necrophilia and the scalping, which also just feels like kind of a grab bag, like, we, we never hear about, oh, you know, when he was young, this thing happened, you know, that's what an American film would probably have had, you know, when he was young, he, there was this one traumatic event, and it involved, you know, two or three different things, and now he's a serial killer, those two or three things keep popping up with all the victims, you know, that kind of thing. But here it's just, uh, I don't know, what's creepy? Necrophilia is creepy. Uh, scalping, you know, like the early, you know, violent immigrants to America did to the Native Americans, you know, back when it actually made sense to say those are some violent invading immigrants. You know, it, it really doesn't, there's no, there's no direct connection between the but yeah 
let's see the right and Joyce called Kalinka asking for Jens and and you know Kalinka was like no no he's not here you know but thinking that she's talking about the Kimbotnia character let's see and yeah and and um Martin dares Jens to avoid the the sacrament you know that thing where they're like cannibalizing Christ that's actually that's a good name for like modern Christianity cannibalizing Christ you know let's just take what we want from the Bible and ignore the rest all the stuff that we don't like I, I recently watched the Kyle Colgren video on the name of the rose and he points out you know to some people the cross means we should you know become rich and to others it means that it's bad to be rich you know it's just it's, yeah excellent and yeah you know it is it is kind of funny when when Lotte you know a priest standing right outside of church as the the congregation leaves shouts I do not want to love anymore and and the you know it is see again it's that thing of like you can understand where she's coming from because Jens is being really obnoxious you know not just in that scene in the entire movie and before the events of the movie clearly but they still get married like why does she not like it feels like it would make much more sense if here near the, if, yeah if maybe near the end she leaves him and then he starts seeming kind of irrational and and out of control uh, you know it, it i i think the movie wants us to think that he might be the the killer but it just doesn't really feel like it completely makes sense the you know certainly there's way more that points to Verma being the killer and you know and it's this thing of like you could like you you shouldn't have given us all the information so early on like you you should have had like like if you told us someone in this movie's universe has committed necrophilia and you say you know oh Verma you know used to work at the morgue you know that's that's fine like oh he worked at the morgue now he's a like police you know detective kind of you know what whatever that's fine but the moment that you tell us oh the the necrophilia used to work there Verma used to work there oh I guess he's the, the necrophile especially once we also learn you know, oh, the the serial killer scalper likes necrophilia and and uses process. You know, just yeah. Let's see, and yeah, the bloody foot footprints and the dead body, very very creepy. How the hell did all of that disappear so quickly? Like, you know, it's it's creepy. It's very effective, but there's no way that Vatma was able to move the body and get all that, you know, wash up all that blood in such a short amount of time. Let's see. And I also, the, the movie, I think it would be better if the movie explained why it's happening now, you know, what set him off. You know, like, if he's been into necrophilia for decades, like, apparently the serial killing is has only been going on for a little while, like, maybe months? I, I forget. I think they say it at the start of the movie, but I don't remember exactly. But certainly it's not, like, years and years. And... 
and and there's also an, another bit of of tension, dramatic tension. You know, is this Martin doesn't want to ask his mother for money. You know, that makes him feel like he isn't quite adult yet. You know, at, at age 24, he feels like he should be responsible enough with money that he shouldn't need to. Let's see. I'm pretty sure, wait, oh, that's right, actually, yeah, I guess back then you did have to both, you might have to both, you might need to have a have a job while you study, you know, otherwise we do tend to, you know, some, some taxpayer money goes to students so that students can focus on study instead of also having a job and thus not focus as much on on studies and it is it is kind of you know she, martin talks about you know being at the job how bad it is and kalinka is like maybe i could go with you and he's like you can't go with me and then cut and they're there together it's, you know and it is it's the very gender stereotypical with the the men in the movie are like behaving like brats and the the women are being more you know mature and responsible Let's see and and in this case I'm, I'm you know it's it's kind of motherly you know she it, it's like you know he's he's talking about you know I, I just can't stand being there alone and she's like I will go with you you know and it's it's very it's it's sweet let's see and they have sex near the dead body which I mean, it fits with the theme of uh, you know this the the connection between sex and death, but she's this sweet character who doesn't like you know like earlier he said that there are no idiots in your world and now she's having sex really close to a, a dead body. It's just you know, and it's it's just there to make him look guilty. They're gonna you know the the semen sample you know there's there's semen on the floor and you know he gets and, and Vatma gets a semen sample and then he's gonna you know actually yeah why didn't they should have had the serial killing only start after he started working at the morgue after Vatma meets him then you'd have is you know then he's like ah if I become a serial killer I can make him seem like the guilty one because it, you know, certainly that wasn't going to work with the old one. So, yeah, like a chunk into the movie, he makes the Vatma makes the decision that he's going to make Martin look like the the guilty one. But by then he was already killing people, so it just doesn't, you know. Again, like I'm not saying American ones are are perfect or even necessarily better than this. But it, I've, I've seen a lot of American serial killer thrillers where that kind of detail has been thought of. And, yeah, you know, we meet the, the jerk director that, you know, the, the stage play director that, you know, yeah, I, I see why Martin said he was an idiot. And... It's pretty wild that Kalinka doesn't think he's an idiot. What a jerk! Yelling at the, the other, you know, that one actor, not Kalinka, but the other one, and then Joyce shows up and she's like, "I'm sorry, I showed up, but it's your boyfriend. You have to make him stop." You know, and that's such a great line. But then when you actually think about, it, like, what, what's she talking about though? Um, because wait, d d does she think? Uh, does Joyce think that Kalinka is with the actual Jens? I guess I could kind of understand that. Although, why does it happen so long after the restaurant scene? Like, it it seems like that would be the thing to, to set up. You know, so it's like, it's this, it's again, this misplaced consequence that there's a lot of in, in these Danish movies. Um, you know, it... it the f actually, before... You know, when when I watched the scene, I was thinking, "Oh, did is this part of the dare? Like, did did Jens tell her go to Kalinka's place and say you gotta make your boyfriend stop? You know, that's really gonna 
stir some shit up, you know, but apparently not. So, like, what did she actually... I, I guess she said that they had sex, although they actually didn't... You know, I, I think he went too far for someone who has, a, you know, a, a monogamous partner, but, yeah. And then we have the, the towel on the head, like, I... I mean, I guess it's supposed to be like, oh, she's being so dramatic, she's covering her head. I kept thinking there's going to be a thing where, like, he, like, maybe he, like, pulls, successfully pulls off the towel, and the scalp goes with or something, and then it's like a nightmare or something, but no, it just, she just sits there with a towel on her head, and he keeps trying to remove it, and she's, you know. It was kind of, like, I don't approve of, like, in my opinion, violence should only be in response to other violence, so I don't approve of her, like, I guess she wasn't trying to drown him, just, like, freak him out. But I, you know, on the other hand, I really, really despise people who cheat, so it's, I'm, I'm torn. Let's see, and... Yeah, Martin is getting a bad reputation at the hospital. And the we we hear that like the it somehow Verma made it look like there was no one to open the door after him. And it's like how? Like I you know, I get okay, you know, police maybe he has like special there's there's things he can do but it just doesn't no he it, it, it seems like he can do things that he shouldn't be able to do without like some kind of supernatural thing or something let's see and um right and martin tells Vatma about Joyce and Jens which of course means they're now involved now he plans things for that and I guess, like, it's just, it feels so weird to even say, but I, th no, yeah, the, it's, it's text. The movie says that Martin thinks that Jens is the serial killer, and it just feels like, how could he possibly actually believe that? It just feels, and this is the kind of thing, like, it would, that would work so much better if he wasn't present when Joyce said, you know, one of my customers likes me to pretend, you know, to, to play dead. Like, it's... And you could so easily have done this. Like, just have, like, a scene... Let's see. I guess they're, they're too close at the tables. But, like, if... Maybe if, if, yeah, like, maybe, maybe, um, uh, Jens is sitting in the, you know, he's like, okay, Joyce will be here any minute. As soon as she comes in, just come in and, and into the restaurant. He leaves, then Joyce shows up, and, you know, yeah, and, and, um, let's see, Martin says something like, you know, so, this, do you think your job is kind of weird, and, then she says, I don't know, there's this one guy who wants me to pretend I'm dead, but he pays good money for it. That was also a thing, like, I mean, I'm guessing whoever wrote the subtitles is Danish. You know, certainly, they have to understand Danish. They didn't, like, convert the money at all. So there's, just, you know, people are talking about crowns which is going to mean nothing to the average american is like what what is what does that even mean like like the british like the the british monarchy wear crowns what is you know like just convert it's not it's like let's see back i think back then it was like one let's see one dollar was seven crowns or do i have that back no, I think yeah, I think that's accurate. So you know, instead of saying oh he paid me on crowns, to say like, what would that be? I guess fifteen. He paid me fifteen bucks for it. You know, just like 
it's not that difficult. Just yeah. Anyway, I know I sometimes go harder on Danish films than than some others. Just you know, I know we can do better. Is all. Let's see and. Yeah, and then we see Joyce drink wine, which makes me wonder, is that inconsistent writing, or is it just that, oh, she's that sad? Because earlier we were told that she doesn't, she, you know, she said, I can't hold my liquor or something like that. Let's see, and Joyce is attacked, and, let's see, right, and, and yeah, and just before she's attacked, you know, she says, I've never, I've never traveled, have you? They say they say it's supposed to broaden the mind, but for Americans it mostly just widens the os. And yeah, so Verma happens to attack Joyce when Kalinka is looking for her. And again, like I'm just saying, an American movie would make sure that there was a reason for that. But here it's just ridiculous contrivance. Like how could it? But like literally. If Verma had been there just a little bit earlier, or a little bit later, it would have gone completely different. And there's no actual reason why it's, you know, I, I get why Kalinka wants to talk to Joyce again, you know, to try to clear up what's going on. Because, you know, she says one thing, Martin says another, and it's this thing of, like, she doesn't, you know, she hates the idea of him cheating on her. But she does feel a lot of trust for him, so just, yeah. And we get the the psycho strings, very nicely done. And and yeah, it's revealed that it's Verma. An hour and seventeen minutes in, so there is half an hour of movie. Oh, hold on, hold on, no, twenty twenty four minutes of movie. And it's just, I just, I think if they just revealed it when Verma and Martin is in the room, you know, with, right with the bat, if that was the big reveal instead of us knowing, because the fact that we know doesn't really change. Like, I guess it's supposed to make it tenser when Verma is right by, yeah, yeah, Verma, Verma says and does a couple of things as Martin is trying to figure out who the killer is. And it would have played different, but I think it would have played better if we didn't know it was Verma until the the bat hit. Let's see, and yeah, and and Verma writes an M. You know, he also writes. We actually actually don't remember what his last name is, but it it's like the initials. But yeah, in in Fritz Lang's M. They write in an M to, to indicate who the bad guy is. And and there was this one um let's see. Yeah, um there was a, a critic who pointed out, you know, this this uh, reference. Uh, you know, the, the perpetrator is eventually betrayed by the tune he whistles, which again is like M, so yeah. Which, if you haven't watched, like it's you know, in, I haven't watched every single Fritz Lang movie, but I don't think I've seen one that wasn't worth watching. You know, he directed M, Metropolis. Just it's unreal how talented he was. Let's see. It's you know, it's it's one of those things. Like sometimes you'll have you know really hard right people saying, you know, hardcore conservatives saying, oh, you know, why are there so many Jews in, you know, in media? I don't know. Maybe it's because they're really freaking good at making movies, you know, just, you know, and, and I believe, I want to say Fritz Lang was one of the ones who had to flee Let's see. Yeah, yeah, he ended up escaping Nazi Germany, and yeah, it's it's really, really, you know, it, you know, 
any Jewish person murdered by the Nazis is, is a, a tragedy. I'm not saying it's only the ones who are unbelievably talented. Just, yeah. Yeah, he has been cited as one of the most influential filmmakers of all time. Yeah. Yeah, and and M is a precursor to film noir, so just yeah. Let's see. And Yeah, the the last chunk of the movie is legitimately quite tense and you know Martin on the phone trying to figure out who the killer is. Like, it's not the best scene like that. I've, and, and I already mentioned, I think the viewer shouldn't have already known. But, you know, so yeah, he calls, he calls the doctor to try to provoke him and say, I have a message from Joyce. So, you know, and try to call, tries to call the, the old Night Watch and the the um what's it called the the let's see yeah try um and and asks you know the guy you know is he in a mental institution which is a not not a you know i guess maybe that's what cuz like i read the the plot synopsis for the new for the sequel and apparently in that one, Velma has been in, like, an institution in for, for the nearly 30 years. That's also, I I kind of forgot that he, get, he gets shot, like, twice and in the torso at that. So him surviving is pretty wild. But, I mean, dude gives such an excellent performance. I, I realize I didn't talk about it in, in the review itself because I just didn't want to give away. Um, but, but, yeah, yeah. Um, and and you know maybe you might not even believe you when I we me when I tell you the following but um, Ulf Pilko who plays Vatma the the killer in this movie he's actually known as a as a comedian like he's he you know yeah he he I forget is he the one who does a really killer impersonation of the Queen. I, or they, no, that might be... Well, anyway, it's been a long time since I watched Danish comedy, but he's he's unbelievably funny. Uh, he's, he's... Yeah. And there actually... When this movie came out, there actually was a, um, a stand-up comedian who said, how ridiculous is it? We finally make a good Danish horror movie, and the killer, Ulf Pilgo, you know, it's... Yeah. But but yeah, um, he he really gives an amazing performance. He's he's intensely creepy, which at first we kind of we 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 chalk it up to well you know he's he his job is is dealing with dead people. He he's he catches serial killers. You know, of course he'd be creepy. But, you know, and, and it is also, like, when, after you've watched the entire movie and you think back and you, you know, he said that line, you know, when I, when I hunt a serial killer, you know, when I look in the mirror, I don't see my face, I see the killer's face. It's like, that was laying it on pretty thick. We, we get it. He's, he's the killer. That's, yeah. And, yeah, Velma sneaks up on Martin and provokes him into attacking him with a baseball bat and you know and then we have the thing with where he can't get into the the room and he does manage to get in and confronts Velma who has Kalinka and he ends up tied as well and the fire alarm you know does force Velma yeah and it is kind of it's it's silly how many chances Velma takes here at the end. Like, why? You know, one of the big ones is is Jens. Why does he just handcuff him once to a thing? You know, and then we find out, oh, you know, he he like cut through. Which, you know, that's maybe also where some people get the torture porn connection. Uh, and and you know, I don't necessarily hate the element of the the knife that you know. 
oh, you know, it was cut with the knife, and, you know, check the drawer, <gasps> the knife is gone, and there's all, the, you know, but why, do, he's a cop, he has multi, you know, he has access to more handcuffs, you know, it's, it's such as, and why does he leave the knife there? You know, what is, it's just, it's such a silly, and it, it just, it just, it feels like a first draft, and it, it sucks, because I know we can do better. And it is legitimately tense when he, you know, he's about to scalp Kalinka with the, the you know, s uh, electrical saw thing that they, I, I think it's like an autopsy tool. And, you know, for the genre, this was a very small climax. You know, it doesn't have to be, like, a big set piece, but, like, at least have some more reveals, have some, you know, dramatic... Just, if, if yeah. Um, again, you know, like, seven just run in circles around this when, when it comes to that. And, yeah, so Jens manages to shoot Verma, and then we have the wedding, and, you know, here at the end, Martin brings up the, you know, oh, this was a movie, it would be called Night Guard, and the, the, which, you know, in his defense, in the defense of, I guess, Ole Bornadale, who wrote it, the Danish word for like of uh, you know it if you translate directly, then it sounds like night guard would be the actual. Yeah, I uh, you know and and ninety ninety four he didn't he didn't have the internet to check you know so yeah he just he just directly translated the the yeah. Anyway, and, and yeah, you know, Martin says, you know, say no to the priest. And then he said, no, I, I was joking, I was joking. And then, you know, it's this, is he actually going to, you know, and he does say no, but that's because the priest mixes up the, the names. And we end with some laughter in church, which I think there's too little of these days, especially considering that the Bible is the, the book they they use which like comedy masterpiece if we're being honest if you read the right parts of the bible it is an unbelievably funny book especially because it doesn't mean to be anyway yes so the the yeah you know basically they wanted a, an ending that was memorable and i i'm not sure there's any other reason why the the you know every so often they'll mention oh it's like a movie you know we watch too many bad movies there's the you know if this was a movie it would be like i i don't think there was any other reason than just you know he he came up with this ending which you know it, it the the it's this thing of is you know how far is jens going to go you know is it like he there keeps being this tension between is Jens gonna ruin everything between him and Lotte? Uh, we have this thing of, you know, he doesn't really respect the church, or, you know, he he basically, you know, he kind of made prison, the prison, he kind of made marriage sound like a prison earlier. Uh, we have this element of, you know, the, the yeah, it, it finishes, it, it's one last little dare, and I feel like there's one more thing there. Um, maybe that's it. But but yeah, you know, I I think that's why it's it's there. And you know, it's uh, I'm not blaming it for not living up to Scream because Scream came later. But it. The fact that Scream came later and and really made such great use of this element of the metatextual just, yeah, you know, it, it really underlines that this isn't that, you know, and, and it's it's too bad because if you look at the values, the, the things this movie does right, like it is legitimately 
the the exploration of you know this thing of being being so young that nobody takes you seriously and being old enough that you're boring kind of the you know by the standards of many young people at least you know yeah it it just is you know there's there's something there and i think the movie does a pretty good job exploring it i wish that you know joyce wasn't used by characters and movie alike the way that but the the fact that it you know it it in some ways resembles seven and scream and these kinds of things just makes it feel less you know I, I i wish that they had come up with i think the idea of someone working the night shift you know being being the night watch at this you know morgue like there's something really interesting there and i don't think that this kind of fairly straightforward murder mystery was the most interesting thing to to do with that setup you know, like I quoted a critic saying it it squanders this this interesting setup and you know I mean I I don't it's not that every movie has to be you know I, I try I try to find something good to say about everything I do a video on I try not to do videos on s movies that I just don't think are interesting to, to talk about and and that don't have any positives to say about but the the fact that I can't remember the movie that I'm, I'm pretty is it ah, did I move it I could have sworn it used to be very close by because it's it's by that author who gosh it's right on the tip of my tongue. Okay, um, that's it. There's this Danish movie called Sister Team. It's from '95. Um, that's right. I what what is it called again? As the the American title is the is Final Hour, and it's one of those things because the thing is. Sister team, it does mean your final hour, but it also means like last, the last class of the day, you know, a school day. And I don't know if there is a, any singular phrase in English that can mean both of those things. So, you know, there's something lost in translation. Anyway, really love that movie. It's, it's, super ballsy of them to make a slasher movie before Scream brings it back. Like, when they made that movie, slashers were dead. Nobody was making slashers still. And I'm not saying that the... Right, and yeah. IMDb does list that as a horror thriller. That one also has a fairly low budget. Um, let's see. It is an hour and 23 minutes. You know, so it wouldn't have been... Like, it's not this completely other you know what that movie does is that a huge chunk of it is set in the one location which the movie makes scary and i think the the concept of a guard who works at the morgue you know i think there's a, a really, really scary movie, a consistently scary movie, in a story that, from very early on, is set pretty much only in there. You know, they wouldn't have to do the meta thing that Final Hour does, you know, and, yeah, ultimately, they probably couldn't quite do... I guess maybe they could talk about, as, as the... Yeah... Several characters are trapped in this morgue in order to keep from going crazy, from being trapped in there. They try to talk about what would you be doing right now if you weren't trapped in here. And that's how we get this exploration of, 
you know, how do you want to live your life? Are you spending the time the, in the way that you won't regret later kind of thing? But as it is, I just, yeah, I wish it's, and again, like, you know, I've, I've already said f first draft. I, I think the, the movie, you know, it's, it's essential, as it is, this movie, Night Watch, is basically this kind of, maybe marriage, maybe like timeshare kind of thing of like, you know, these two movies, the this horror movie that that works really really well when you know especially when we're at the morgue and it's you know strange things are happening kind of thing, and then you have this thing of just these you know two twenty something law students who are you know struggling with with growing up and and becoming thirty something grown responsible mature adults kind of thing and ultimately it probably would have been better if they had made two different movies instead of trying to because you could so easily see like yeah you could start this with you know maybe maybe instead of working at the morgue maybe it's a thing of you know they you know so somehow they end up at the the morgue very early on yeah, maybe it's maybe it's a dare. Maybe one of them dares the other to go in there. He goes in there and and stays there and then the other one tries to scare him by like, you know, yeah, suddenly appearing and the the Yeah, maybe yeah, maybe the three of them try to scare or no. Jens scares Martin who was the first to to enter and then like the yeah, somehow the, the two women also end up in there. And then the movie is them locked inside the, the you know, try, the, not, not just the morgue, but this entire part of the building. And maybe the actual Night Watch is a serial killer. And, you know, they, they discover a dead body early on, and then they're trying to hide, realizing the, you know, Whoever the Night Watch is, that's the serial killer that they've already heard about, and and you have that as the as the thing, you know. But you know, as a murder mystery, way too few suspects. It's super obvious that it's Velma, and the the yeah, I think there is an entire movie in just the the immature game of of Dare. And it's not, you know, it's it's okay to make multiple movies that really explore similar themes, but in different ways. But making one movie that combines several ideas, you know, yeah, I think I think it would have been it would have been a very very effective horror movie if the entire thing had been set at the morgue, you know, or maybe you know a chunk of it is at the morgue, and then maybe after a while they escape the morgue. But they go, they, then they end up trapped in another location, you know, or maybe they leave the morgue and get to the cops, only to realize one of the cops they're working with is actually the serial killer. And then they, you know, there's some maybe, maybe different kind of tension, but they're trying to figure out which of the, these cops is the killer, because it has to be one of them for some, you know, they, they have some clue that that's the case. Just, yeah, I really think that would have been, yeah. And that is it for the first of the thoughts section. So let's get to the last one. So this is, uh, um, there we go. Notes taken before watching. So, according to Wikipedia, Professor Morten Müller strongly deplored, professor, strongly deplored the film's distorted image of doctors, students, and researchers' treatments of body parts. He stated, the movie Night Watch has certainly not had a positive effect on us. I don't know what people imagine that we should be sexually interested in the dead, want to lie down on their bed, a crazy fantasy that has not the slightest hold in reality. And, yeah, it really, it, it sucks that the... That, that people did think this, you know, I, I, 
you know, I watched it in 2009. I didn't think like it's, we got it. We got to get better at not getting the wrong idea about reality from a fictional movie. That's that's you know, in in general, human beings, we have to get better at that. Let's see, and, um, right, a couple of credit quotes. I did have a slight issue, though, with how the film plays out. We only get to see one murder in the movie, and we see the aftermath of another one. I personally felt this might be better served if we did get to see more of them, but I can't fault how it decides to play out with a mystery. It actually is more of a police procedural or a giallo, jolly, without seeing the killer really work. They are gloved in a scene, though, and I was left guessing until the end, which I did like. The close-up of uh, Vatma's face when he realizes Kalinka was at the murder scene is both funny and terrifying as he weighs up his options. Uh, the climax tends to fall into some minor cliche with the heroes being hogtied, but the time it took to do that, the killer could have easily killed them. After a tense, if totally awkward, beginning, climaxing with a neat double bluff, Nightwatch falters rapidly as Martin is put in the position of being the wrong man accused, with his friends left to try and prove his innocence. Perhaps the reason this fails is because, as a protagonist, Martin is an unlikable, cowardly man, nihilistic and ungrateful for his good fortune, so it is hard for viewers to care for his fate. Nightwatch is hamstrung by its occasional misogyny, which includes the actions of Martin and Jens, that neither character seems to learn from their mistakes or experience any kind of redemption is also deeply unsatisfying. Absolutely agreed. The climax also features a gruesomely cringeworthy moment which precedes Saw by ten years as one of the characters is forced to carve off an extremity in order to save their own life. And yeah, that is it. So... Let me know in the comments, what is your favorite 90s serial killer thriller? And are you excited for the second Night Watch? And yeah, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. Want you more links to stuff like around the playlist? It's a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and a couple of others. One talking about, uh, yeah, at least one talking about a Star Wars thing. One talking about the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of The Bear. One for, same thing for Scream Queens. I do a daily video where I talk about the most recent two episodes I've rewatched of the 90s X-Men animated show. Let's see. And recently the Dream Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if more of this like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I will catch you next time.